Hi, my name's Renee, and I'm here with uh, violinist Jennifer, and how do you say your last name? Grouchy. It rhymes with grouchy. Grouchy. Okay, that's a good way to remember it. Um, she's an amazing violinist. She had her debut in Carnegie Hall in 2004, and she began violin at the age of three. She's performed all over the world in places like London, Beijing, and... Uh, Hall and Wild Hall and and, uh, and Wigmore was mm -hmm. it also in, in Wigmore Hall, and so she is so nice. She's performing here with the Las Cruces Symphony, uh, the Cacciatrian Violin Concerto, and she was so great to answer a few questions. So my first question to you was, um, what were some of the characters and emotions that you thought of when you were learning the Cacciatrian? It's such a great piece, and I really like the interchange between the winds that you have in this piece. Yeah, especially in the last movement. Well, actually, throughout the whole piece, there's so many great interweaving lines between the, the solo violin and, and the cello section, for example, and the winds. And right. um, Well, I really think of it as it's just such a swashbuckling concerto, and um, particularly the outer movements, the first and the last. Right have so much energy and in terms of the characters um, you know it's really there's a lot of because um, it was Armenian there's right. a lot of that f folk inflected um, thematic material in the concerto and um, so you know I think of, of that folky influence and um, you know there are the really energetic rhythmic sections yes. like it starts with this you know the, the violin figures <laughs> is so energetic and but then that's that um, changes to like the second theme of the first movement is incredibly lyrical and juicy and just it's kind of swanky you know and so <laughs> right. um, yeah I mean there's a lot yeah there's a lot of emotion there but um, like the melodies in the second movement too are just they're really um sultry and sexy yes. and so um i really when i was learning the concerto was was moving between those two characters the one um driving rhythmic that mm -hmm. uh, character that you find at the beginning and like throughout lots the last movement right. um and then that melody the second theme of the first movement that also comes back in the last movement that's just as i said it's just um you know really sexy and and and, and beautiful yes yes Thank you. And, and then um, you play tons of contemporary music. And I was going to ask, how do you determine uh, characters or emotions for contemporary music that might not be so explicit like, like the Cacheterian? Right. Well, a lot of, um, well, there's there are so many different styles of contemporary music, right. of course. But, um, you know, when you start to look at the score, a lot of it sort of dictates what kind of character is, is uh, should be performed with. And you know, there's a lot of contemporary music which is heavily rhythmic, and um, so. But then there's a lot that's that's not that's atmospheric, or um, oh, well, there's just so many styles. Um, or you know, there's a lot of tonal music too that's right. more kind of um, old-fashioned, or I'd say. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so to answer your question, how do I determine what character? Um, and that's really ultimately kind of the most important thing to decide. Once you know, of course, you have to decipher the notes and how the music's put together. But um, really, for an exciting interpretation and performance, it's important to have just a lot of character in everything you do. Right. Um, and so I let the music speak to me. And, and usually, it's pretty um, evident what, what character should be there, whether it's you know, light and happy or really fierce. Um, to use a tire banks term, <laughs> yes. um, or really energetic and driving, or you know, sp space music. You know, I, I use a lot of visual Im imagery Visuals. too. Okay. And you know, whether it's imagining something as vague as I mean, color is pretty specific, but it's still it's not you know that you know, it's still somewhat vague. Or I actually imagine you know a more specific imagery with that's filled out with. You know, whether it's a, a pastoral scene or something that's, you know, uh, some modern music, of course, sounds like sci-fi. Right. Or, mm -hmm. You know, or you, sometimes you can equate it with, with movies you've seen and so on. So have I just try ever, to drive, draw from my yes. experience. Have, have you ever worked specifically with a composer of a new piece? Um, I have on, on many occasions. And what's surprising there is that usually a composer obviously has a very strong idea of how his or her music should sound. Um, but you know, usually when you meet with a composer, you've already worked on the score, right. <laughs> and uh, you know I might come in with um, not knowing, uh, but uh, what the composer had in mind, and come in with it, what ends up being a completely different interpretation from what the composer actually had in mind. But what I found is uh, more often than not, the composer will say, actually, 
that's not what I originally envisioned, but I like what but you're you doing. Like it, and yeah. so it makes yeah. you realize that there's a lot of freedom and leeway yeah. and, um, you know, as long as you're sp following the spirit of the score, but in terms of, you know, when you're talking about characterization and so on, that there's um, really only the, you're limited only by your, the limits of your imagination, I think. Right. Well, thank you so thank much. You. you are so amazing. I hope everyone goes and gets your CDs, especially thank the you. new Stravinsky one. So thanks so much. Thanks for coming again. Thank you.